What's going on guys? In this video we're going to be discussing how to get the memory size of data structures in Python. Now we're going to be using sys.getSizeOf because that is one of the simplest ways to get the memory usage. However, uh, getting the memory usage of complex objects is very, very difficult in Python. This is because Python uses references as well as other various reasons. Now to really get a deep understanding of this subject, you would need to take a deep dive into the CPython source code. And I am not even sure if that's enough because this process of getting the memory usage is just very complicated in Python. There are a lot of references used which makes tracking down the actual memory usage very difficult. There are actually uh, user-made modules that help approximate the memory usage of more complex data types, and I will list that at the end of the Jupyter Notebook. So just to summarize, we're going to be looking at simple data structures and simple data types. So this will just be an overview or an introduction to understanding memory usage in Python. And this is not a comprehensive video. This is just a very easy sort of exploratory introduction. With that said, I think we can just dive into the code itself and explore the various different data structures in Python. So we'll start off with importing sys. Now first we're going to get the memory usage of simple data types. And when I mean simple data types, I mean an int, a float, and a string. So if you look at this cell here, you'll see that I'm trying to get the size of 8, which is an integer, a size of a float, which is 3.0, and a size of an empty string. So let's just run this. All right. Okay, so we get back 28, 24, and 49, and these represent bytes. So a single digit integer actually takes up 28 bytes. A single digit float, well, a 3 with, I guess, one significant digit, will take up 24 bytes, and an empty string will take up 49 bytes. So 28 for an int and only 24 for a float. So that was surprising to me. And a 49 for an empty string. So that's basically the overhead for a string, 49 bytes. Now what we're going to do in the next line or the next cell is we're going to see how much an empty instance of these objects take up. Now in Python, everything is an object. So an int is actually a class float is actually a class and a string is actually a class and we create an object of this by using the int bracket bracket or you know the open bracket close bracket so here we're actually creating an instance of these classes int float and string however we're not allocating any extra memory for the integers such as 8 3.0 and string so with this we'll get the actual overhead or what i'm assuming to be just the overhead of creating instance of these classes. So this is what I'm assuming to be the overhead. So if we run this, you'll see that the integer now only takes up 24 bytes. So the first int took up four bytes, while for the float and string, you still have the same amount of bytes, 24 and 49 respectively. Now let's take a look at a string with four characters. And if we run this, you'll see that we get 53 bytes. So essentially, each character is taking up one byte. So the bulk of the memory usage is with the initialization of a string or creating instance of a string. But if you create a long string, say 100,000 characters, it's only one byte per each character. So I guess instead of creating multiple types of strings, if you could fit everything into one string, you can save a lot of memory. All right, now we're going to explore integers and floats and see the increase in memory usage. Now, if we increase the value of an integer from the earlier 8 to about 1 million, you'll see it still takes up 28. But now, if you see that we tried to get a size of an extremely large number, the memory usage is going to increase. So now we have 36 bytes. So we've increased by 8, and this number has increased by I don't know how many folds, but it's a much larger number than the previous 1 million. So with integers, as your number or the value gets larger and larger, more memory is allocated to cope with that. However, with floats, it's a little different. Now floats always has a certain amount of memory allocated for memory usage. So I did a little research on this, and it seems to be called fixed precision point. And basically, a float will always have the same amount of memory allocated to it. However, there's a very complex algorithm going on in the background 
that helps float create complex numbers with minimal memory usage. Now, due to the fixed memory allocated to float, as the number starts getting more and more complex, float will be forced to round off the significant digits. So basically, since we have a fixed amount of memory allocated to floats, we can't create infinitely complex numbers. Now, due to the algorithm that is used by floats, it is highly optimized to represent large numbers as well as complex numbers. From my experimentation, it seems that using floats, you can save a lot of memory, especially when dealing with larger numbers. Now, this is just when you don't care about some of the digits that come after the decimal point. So if you don't care about the digits that come after the decimal point and you don't care that they're rounded off, then it seems as if you can save a significant amount of memory using float as opposed to integer. So now let's take a look at some of these floats. Remember, there's always a fixed amount of memory allocated for floats because that's how float works in Python. So even if you get an arbitrarily large number or extremely large number, the amount allocated will always be 24 bytes. However, as the numbers get increasingly complex, it will start to round off some of these significant digits. So now we have an extremely large number. And if I get the size of this, you'll see it once again, it's only 24 bytes. Now, if we run this same number or if we print it out, you'll see that it's three to e to the 19th. So basically, it gets rid of all of these digits afterwards and just retains this portion. Because to retain all of the other complex information within the fixed bytes will be extremely difficult. So if we count the significant digits, we'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So basically, this whole portion is retained while this is discarded. Now, despite being an extremely large number, we're only using 24 bytes, and with int, we're using 36 bytes. So as the numbers get increasingly large, it might be better to use floats as opposed to ints if you want to save memory. That's just my takeaway from this little exploration. Okay, so now what we're going to do is take a look at a few more examples. The first thing we'll do is we'll save this large digit to x. And just to make sure it is a float, we'll use type. And as you can see, it's a float. Now what we'll do is we'll square this number to get an extremely large number. So we have e3 to the 19. Um, I'm assuming this is also 3 to the 19 or e to the 19 but we're going to square it. Now we'll save this to a variable y. All right, and then we'll run y. Yep, so it's 9e to the 38. So now we have an extremely large number, 38 significant digits, which is essentially 19 times 2, 38. So that makes sense. And you'll see once again that the size is only 24 bytes. So with large numbers, it seems using floats over int can save you some considerable memory, especially if you're dealing with millions of elements. Okay, now with that done, we're going to look at data structures. So first we're looking at data types, and now we're going to look at data structures. So the three data structures we're going to focus on are our lists, tuples, and dictionaries. So the first thing we'll do is we'll see how much it costs to create an instance of these data structures. And we'll run this, and this is an empty instance. So with the list, it's 64, a tuple is 48, and a dictionary is a whopping 240. So you could see tuples can save you considerable memory if you can switch from lists to tuples. All right, now we're going to add a number to each of these data structures. So we're going to add a three to a list, to a tuple, and a dictionary, and we'll see how much that takes up. So if you do the math, you'll see that it adds eight bytes to the list, eight bytes to the tuple, and the dictionary stays the same. So it seems as if for the dictionary, memory is already pre-allocated for a certain amount of elements. So that's why adding this three key value didn't actually take up any extra memory usage. So creating an instance of a dictionary 
seems to pre-allocate memory for a certain amount of elements or items. So now we're going to try to add multiple items to a list and tuple. If, so if you look at the cell, you'll see that we're adding 10 items um, from 0 to 9, and the memory allocation should be consistent what we saw above, just with more items. So above, we saw the overhead costing 64 and each item costing 8 bytes. So if you have 8 bytes times 10, you should get back 80. And if you add 80 to 64, you should get back 144. Now with tuples, let's see, you have 8 times 10, which is 80, and then you add that to 48. So 80 to 48, so you should get back 128. So with the list, you get 144, and with the tuple, you should get back 128. So let's just run these two cells and see the results. So 144 and 128. So as you can see, even with multiple items, the tuple takes up less memory. Now we're going to see something interesting about lists. The way you create an instance of a list can have an impact on the memory usage. So above, when we created a list, just by adding the digits into the list itself, the two brackets, we got a memory usage of 144. However, if we create the same list using list and range, you'll see that it actually takes up more memory. So let's just run this, and you'll see it takes up 200 bytes. Now just to make sure that there's nothing funny going around, I'll save this to a variable x, and then we'll get the size of x. But as you can see, it takes up 200 bytes. So the way you create a list also has an impact on the memory usage. Now I had to do a little research as to why using list and range takes up extra memory and apparently there's something within range and list itself that forces extra memory allocation. So when you create an instance via a range or list, extra memory is allocated as opposed to when you create a list via simple brackets and all of the elements. So basically, just be careful or just be aware of how you create instances of objects if there's multiple ways to create an instance of these built-in data structures. With that said, we'll move on to the next topic, which is dictionaries. Now earlier with dictionaries, you saw that memory allocation was fixed at 240 despite adding one item. Now if we try to add five items, let's see what happens to the memory allocation. So we've added five items from 0 to 4. Now we're going to get the size of this dictionary. However, it stays constant at 240, which is a little peculiar because the other data structures don't have this effect or this behavior. Now we're going to try to add eight items instead of five, and you'll see that the memory usage increases considerably. So the takeaway from this is dictionaries take up a lot of memory. If you can avoid dictionaries and use tuples, you can save considerable amount of memory when you're dealing with millions of items. All right, and now we're going to jump into the most interesting aspect of getting the memory size of data structures. And it's interesting and also very problematic and complex. All right, so once again, we're going to create two lists, list one and list two using the same method we used above. And if you remember, it should allocate 200 memories each, or 200 bytes each, to these lists. So now we just get the memory. Okay, so 200 bytes each. Now we're going to create a list three, which will take a list one and a list two as its elements. Now, if we do the proper calculations, we should estimate the memory usage to be 200 per each list, so that will be 400, and the list has the overhead of 64. So we have 200, 200 plus 64. So I would assume we would get back 464. So we run this cell to create an instance of list 3. Now if we get the size of list 3, you'll see that it only takes up 80. Now why does it only take up 80? First let's calculate how we get to 80. So the overhead is 64 bytes, okay? Now 8 bytes are being allocated to list 1 and list 2. And if you notice a similar pattern, you'll notice that earlier, with these primitive types, or these integers, we're also allocating 8 bytes per integer, or per element. Now what happens in Python is that these lists that 
hold other objects aren't actually holding the other objects. They're holding references to the other objects. So the list one and list two that it's holding in memory is actually a pointer to the memory or a reference to the memory itself. And these memories are eight bytes each. So list three doesn't actually hold list one and list two. It holds the memory reference or the pointers to list one and list two. And these pointers are eight bytes each. So that's why we're basically getting back 80 instead of the 464 that I calculated. Now you can use recursion and it's actually stated within the docs. In the docs itself, the documentation, they have a script within the sys.getSize of description or a link to the script that tells you how you can use recursion to get the true value of data structures or get the true value of complex data structures, the true memory usage. So basically the way recursion would work is first you would get the memory of list three, which would be 64 plus the two elements, which are eight elements each in this case. Then you would get the true memory allocation of list one, which would be the overhead associated with list one, 64 plus the amount of elements, so in this case there's 10 elements, so 8 times 10 will be 80, and then you would have to do another uh, level of recursion to get the memory location of the simple data types, which are integers. And then you add all those up, and then you go through list 2, and you go through each level of recursion and get the true memory of list 2 as well. So that is the way you use recursion to get the true memory usage of a more complex data structure. Now if you guys are interested in this subject there is a lot more information within these links. First, Pimpler. Now Pimpler is a user created framework that approximates the memory usage of complex objects. So I'm assuming functions and classes are included as well. Um, I haven't actually taken a look but from Stack Overflow it seems to be very popular and highly rated. So you guys could take a look at that and see how it deals with classes and functions. Now there's also a couple of links to Stack Overflow threads where there's a lot of good answers and there's a lot of good discussion regarding this topic. So you can take a look at that as well. Um, there are a lot of topics on this or a lot of threads regarding the subject but I listed the two that I found to be the most uh, useful. So you guys could take a look at that as well. All right, so this was a long introduction to getting the size or the memory size of data structures in Python. Hope you guys found this video useful, and I'll see you guys next time.